in the last couple of videos, we've been investigating pointwise convergence, uniform convergence, and how that works alongside continuity and differentiability. So first, let's recall these definitions real quick. So a sequence of functions f sub n is said to converge pointwise to f on a if for all x in a we have the limit as n approaches infinity of f sub n of x is f of x. So since we've fixed our x up here arbitrarily, then this is actually just a sequence of numbers. And in some previous videos, we saw that this pointwise convergence does not necessarily preserve continuity or differentiability and so on and so forth. But then we looked at this notion of uniform uh, convergence and we said that fn converges to f uniformly if given epsilon bigger than zero, there is an n which is a natural number such that f sub n of x minus f sub x in absolute values is less than epsilon and that's true for all n bigger than or equal to n and x in a. So the important thing to notice here is that this capital N was brought into existence before we said anything about this X here. So this capital N will depend on epsilon, but not X. Versus if you were to write down the epsilon N definition of this limit, then that capital N has the possibility of depending on X. Okay, so let's look at what we're going to prove in this video. So let's suppose that fn converges to f pointwise on an interval a, b, and each f sub n is differentiable. Next, we're going to suppose that fn prime converges to g uniformly on a, b, and then that is going to imply that f is differentiable and f prime equals g. So I think it's really interesting here that we only have to assume that the original function is pointwise convergence on our interval, but then the derivative of our original sequence of functions has uniform convergence. That's where we need that uniform convergence here. So now let's like lay out the idea for this proof first. Well, we're gonna do the first step and then lay out the idea for the rest of it and then jump into it. Okay, so let's say we are given epsilon bigger than zero. Notice essentially what we want to show is the following inequality. So this is gonna be the absolute value of f of x minus f of c over x minus c where I guess I should say C is just some number on the interval A, B, where we're trying to take the derivative of this F function. So we're going to look at the difference of this and G of C. And if we can make that difference as small as we want, so if we can make that less than epsilon, then that means this guy right here, as x approaches c, is approaching g of c. But then by the definition of the derivative, this guy right here is approaching f prime of c. Well, so that means f prime of c equals g of c. So in other words, we've got this kind of thing happening. So we have f sub n of x, minus f uh, sub n of c over x minus c. So notice, as n approaches infinity, we have this object is going towards f of x minus f of c over x minus c. Great. But then also, as x goes to c, because of the differentiability of all of the f sub n functions, this is going to f um, n prime of c. <clears throat> okay, good. And then from here, this thing right here, a priori, we do not know that uh, this thing has a limit, but we do know that these limits exist because we're assuming this uniform convergence. So we do know that this approaches g of c. So all of this picture right here, we know is true. I guess I should say that this limit is as n goes to infinity. In other words, all of those respective limits exist. And what we are trying to show is that this limit, which I'm dotting in yellow, also exists. 
and that would finish it off. In other words, that would show that the derivative, well, on the one hand, this would approach f prime of c, but then on the other hand, it would approach g of c, but that would mean f prime of c was equal to g of c, and that would finish it off. Okay, so now that we've got a picture of what's going on, I'll go ahead and clean this up and we'll look at the proof. Okay, so now that we've looked at some of the intuition behind this proof, let's go ahead and launch into it. So we're gonna have our setup. So given epsilon bigger than zero and C in A, B. So I'm gonna go ahead and write down what we want to show in the end, but we essentially wanna show that F prime of C is equal to G of C where all of that's interpreted by the inequality that we had on the last board. So now we're gonna use our given information to bring about a couple of quantities. So the first thing that we're gonna use is the fact that Fn prime converges to G uniformly. So that means there exists a capital N1, which is a natural number, such that um, if or for all little m bigger than or equal to capital N1, we have the absolute value of f sub m prime evaluated at c minus g of c is less than, and here we're gonna use epsilon over three. Okay, good. And then next, we're gonna use the Cauchy criterion for the uniform convergence of f prime to get another value of n. So that means there also exists an n2, which is a natural number, such that for m and n bigger than or equal to n2, we have f sub m prime evaluated at x minus f n prime evaluated at x is less than epsilon over three also. And this is gonna be true for all x. Great, again, that's by the uniform convergence and the Cauchy criterion, which was proved in the last video. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is take the maximum of these two capital N's. So I'm gonna call that capital N, which is equal to the max of N1 and N2. And we're gonna use the fact that F sub capital N is differentiable. So F sub capital N is differentiable. So that means there exists a delta bigger than zero such that we have the following inequality. So we'll have the absolute value of F sub capital N of X minus F sub capital N of C over X minus C minus um, F sub capital N prime of C is less than another epsilon over three. Notice that's the same as saying that the limit of this object is that object over there. We've just written it with the epsilon delta definition. So now that I've constructed these three inequalities, this one, this one, and this one, I'll get rid of everything else and we'll move on to the next step. So on the last board for an arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero, we constructed this natural number capital N and this number delta that made these three inequalities satisfied. So we've got the absolute value of F prime M evaluated at C minus G of C is less than epsilon over three. Good, and that's when M is bigger than or equal to this capital N. And then we have the absolute value of F M prime minus F N prime, both evaluated at X is less than epsilon over three. And then finally, we've got this uh, difference is less than epsilon over three as well. Now we're ready to launch into the next step. And the next step is uh, applying the mean value theorem. So I'll just say apply the MVT to the function Fm minus Fn on the interval Cx. And I guess I should say where X is just some fixed number on the open interval C minus delta C plus delta. And notice that X could be on either side of C in this case. So this could also be the interval X comma C, just depending on which side of C you've chosen X. But the argument is analogous regardless. Okay, so applying the MVT to this function on this interval tells us 
that there exists a number t on the corresponding open interval c to x where we have the following equality so we're going to have fm prime evaluated at t minus fn prime evaluated at t equals so it'll be fm evaluated at x minus fn evaluated at x minus fm evaluated at c minus fn evaluated at c and all of this is over x minus c Okay, so that's just a straightforward application of this mean value theorem. Okay, good. So notice I've already chosen my m and n so that this difference is less than epsilon over three. And this is true for all x on the interval a, b by the uniform convergence of fm prime. So what that means is that I can take the absolute value of this right hand side and I know that that is less than epsilon over three. So let's maybe go ahead and write that down. So we have absolute value of, so I'm gonna write this as f sub m x minus f sub n x minus f sub m c minus f sub n c and all of this is over x minus c. And this needs to be less than, or this is less than epsilon over three. So notice I've just inserted this right-hand side of this equation from the mean value theorem into this inequality here. Okay, good. Now from here, I'm gonna go ahead and take the limit of the left-hand side of this as m approaches infinity. And I'm allowed to do that because this statement holds for all m bigger than or equal to n. So if I let m tend towards infinity, well, it's going to be true for the limit as well. And we know such a limit exists because of this pointwise convergence, which we have assumed. So again, I'm going to take the limit as m approaches infinity to this. So let's see what that's going to give us. That'll give us the absolute value of f of x minus fn x minus f of c minus fn c um, all over x minus c is less than epsilon over 3. Okay, great. But now notice we're kind of almost there because we've got this thing and this thing over this x minus c, but that looks a lot like the derivative of this function f, which is that function that we were limiting towards. Okay, so I'll maybe go ahead and get rid of what I can and we'll go on to the next step. So over the last several boards, we have constructed the following inequalities, ending with this one, which arrived by using the mean value theorem on a carefully chosen function. So recall, I took the limit as m approached infinity before, and then this inequality held for all little n bigger than or equal to capital N, including little n equals capital N. So that's how I've rewritten this here. Also, I've kind of changed it up just a little bit, but that's just a very, very simple rewriting. Now we're ready to look at our, the object in question. So we want to look at f of x minus f of c over x minus c minus g of c. So again, if we can make this less than epsilon, then we have shown exactly what we wanted to show, which was that f prime of c is the same thing as g of c, like we discussed before. And we're gonna do this by adding and subtracting the same thing. In other words, by adding zero a few different ways. So I'm gonna rewrite this as f of x minus f of c over x minus c minus f sub n x minus f sub n c over x minus c. So I've subtracted off that term, but that's helpful because I've got control over the size of that. Okay, but next I'm gonna add that term back in because we wanna make sure that we didn't change anything over x minus c. But now I can see that I can compare this term with this f prime in C. So I'm going to add and subtract that term in. So let's go ahead and do subtract minus F prime in C, but then we need to add in F prime in C. But then I've got this extra F prime in C, but I can compare that to the G of C, which is the term that I had not included in this. So this is like this big two line thing, but notice I can apply the triangle inequality to these components. 
So this part right here, this part right here, and then finally this part right here. So applying the triangle inequality to those components, I get that this is less than or equal to the absolute value of f of x minus f of c over x minus c minus f sub n x minus f sub n c over x minus c. So that's that first component. And then I have plus absolute value of f sub n x minus f sub n c over x minus c minus f prime sub n c. So that would be like the second component. And then plus absolute value of f prime n c minus g of c. But then by our carefully constructed inequalities above, each of these is less than epsilon over three. So that means we have the whole thing is less than epsilon over three, plus epsilon over three, plus epsilon over three, but that's gonna be equal to epsilon. So now notice if we start at this extreme left-hand side and end at this extreme right-hand side, you'll see that we have constructed the necessary inequality to show this, which was our goal. And that's a good place to stop.